Hello and welcome. This is Ithaca DSA Presents. I am Maribel Teneo. I am speaking with Jeremy Cohen. Today, Jeremy will be talking to us about the expected gains of the proposed tax of rich legislation and what it will take to win this reform. Jeremy Cohen is the North Brooklyn representative on the New York City DSA Steering Committee. In this role, he has worked on field and political education for the Tax of Rich campaign. He organizes the North Brooklyn Socialist Night School and is a foot soldier in New York City DSA campaigns for healthcare, housing, and electing socialists to office. He is also building captain in his tenant association. A sociologist who researches public education, the labor movement, and inequality he teaches at the School of Visual Arts. He is very excited to be building working class power in New York State. Welcome, Jeremy. We are so happy to have you. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Mari. Really excited. Great. So briefly summarize what the Tax the Rich campaign legislation consists of, what the advantages and disadvantages of focusing on state as opposed to local or federal tax reform are. Yeah, um, so I think the Tax the Rich campaign is an amazing opportunity to extend and push farther the power that the left has been building in New York State um, over the last few years. Um, I think that uh, the, the composition of the New York State Senate has changed, has shifted, um, both with the removal of the IDC, as well as the election of a number of socialist legislators to Albany. Um, this is a big opportunity for the left and a uh, two thirds um, supermajority of Democrats now that can override vetoes of Governor Cuomo. This is a huge opportunity for the left to expand, to take up um, ambitious, uh, powerful platforms that build, you know, kind of organize a working class majority base while simultaneously sort of dividing uh, kind of revealing the, the wolves and the uh, sheep the who are the real people who are willing to pass reforms that will change working class New Yorkers lives and who are the, you know, Democrats in name only um, legislators. So the Tax the Rich campaign is very ambitious, but it is sort of foundational for any of the things we want to do. And I think that's been, you know, a, a big thought for uh, New York City left for a long time. Um, and I think generally in New York State is unless we have new sources of revenue. Unless we expand the pie, none of the things we want, healthcare, housing, education, um, uh, jobs, green infrastructure, any of these things, transportation, none of these things are gonna happen unless we expand the revenue base of New York State and bring our tax system up to the 21st century economy in a way that neoliberal elites have been blocking for 50 years. So that's the attempt and that's the kind of political context. And I think, you know, basically the legislation is designed to um, shift funds from the wealthy to the government through three main means, taxing, um, first of all, high incomes. And as we know, the neoliberal period has seen an incredible concentration of income in the hands of the top 1%. Um, so first a tax of high incomes. Second, attacks on big businesses, um, especially Wall Street. Wall Street makes up a greater share of the New York economy than ever before, about 20% of the economy. Um, unlike in other financial centers, New York State uh, doesn't tax Wall Street almost at all. It doesn't tax financial transactions. So there's huge uh, public money to be made from Wall Street and from what Wall Street is up to and the windfall profits that they're making. And finally, taxing obscene wealth, um, taxing inheritances, large inheritances that 
distort our society by creating something like an aristocracy of people who pass down tremendous estates, multi-million dollar estates to their children and children's children and children's children um, and taxing that, taxing wealth, uh, intangible assets as well. So the bills are basically, you know, trying to do this difficult thing, which is getting money out of the elite, <laughs> um, something that is very hard to do politically, but is also fundamental for transforming our infrastructure, for building a, a common um, infrastructure for working class New Yorkers, building better lives for working class New Yorkers, and for shifting the overall dynamic of these last 50 years, which has been all the gains of our economic growth going to a tiny, tiny proportion at the top. It's about time we stop that. And the Tax of the Rich campaign is designed to make a huge incursion into that dynamic. Um, just while I'm remembering, the last thing you did mention about state and federal, I think, you know, right now, um, the left has, because of the political factors I mentioned, the left has a fair bit of power in New York State, or at least it's beginning to have power. Unfortunately, because of the pushback against the Bernie Sanders campaign and the coalescence of the establishment Democrats to sabotage and destroy his campaign, um, the left is still, to some degree, less powerful on a federal level, though obviously there are stalwarts like AOC and others mm -hmm. and the growing squad that is um, pushing forward things. Many, many of these taxes, like really taxing the rich, is best on a federal level if possible, because it gives the rich, it makes it harder for them to avoid those taxes. Um, it also, the federal government has enforcement powers and ways to prosecute tax avoidance uh, strategies across say international borders that obviously a state like New York state doesn't have. So ultimately it would be great. You know, there's some talk, people are saying that maybe in a later year in the Biden administration, there's gonna be um, possibly an infrastructure plan that they try to pass that is in part funded through taxing the rich, you know, then great. Then our campaign we're hoping is building infrastructure, building consciousness that pushes towards these changes at the federal level as well. But we shouldn't think that we in New York are helpless. And this is one of Cuomo's lines. Cuomo loves to say like, oh, it's all in the federal government's hands. We can't do anything. But New York state is one of the biggest economies in the world. It's like the 10th biggest economy in the world. Um, it has, it's bigger than South Korea. It's bigger than Russia. Um, it is a humongous economy, but the gains of that economy are uh, extremely concentrated in a tiny number of hands and, you know, a hundred something billionaires hands. And we need to shift that dynamic and we can shift a lot of that dynamic here in New York state and be a leader um, that helps uh, build infrastructure for this to happen on the federal level as well. And and how does this campaign uh, relate to some of the major political developments of 2020? You mentioned a bit about the Bernie campaign, uh, but also the pandemic, defund the police. Um, how, how do you see this tying some of that together or supporting it? It's been a really quiet year, right, for politics. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, well, on the Bernie campaign, I, I you know, I even think, BLM, by the way, even the BLM movement. Defund. Yeah, yeah, hundred um, percent. I'll I'll go kind of in order that you listed them. So I think the Bernie campaign um, clearly leads into this because one of the great, I think, lessons of Bernie for the left is that we, the majority, like of Americans, are actually with us on policy for the most part. And so 90%, there was a poll done by um, New York State uh, Teachers Union and uh, I forget who else, I think CWA, where they found 90% of New Yorkers want to, don't think the wealthy are paying their fair share and want to, instead of benefit cuts, um, if there is a budget hole, doing uh, uh, taxing the rich. So the people are with us. And I think the Bernie Sanders campaign taught us that What's fundamentally missing is not so much that people agree with left-wing policies, it's more that um, the organizing for them to be able to affect what they want to achieve into reality because of the chokehold of money on our politics. So I think the Bernie campaign's lessons of starting with these big majoritarian demands that make the lines of division in our society very, very clear, and then giving, um, giving people the capacity to feel like they can change the world through organizing. Um, I think that is, you know, that's one of the things I find inspiring about this campaign. That's, it would make a huge difference in people's lives. It's already popular. We just need to organize to make it happen.
Um, I think in terms of COVID, I mean, obviously COVID introduces just a huge level of urgency in this because of the uh, holes in the budget. Now, the budget holes are actually a little less maybe than was anticipated in part because online business um, has been booming, obviously. And so that has given some sales tax revenues that weren't expected to New York State. But ultimately, the pandemic has exacerbated all the worst dynamics of our society. It has, you know, we've seen billionaires make, you know, some people are saying like half a trillion dollars during this pandemic while people are close to the edge. Um, we've seen working class people ground into dust. We've seen uh, people exposed, our workers exposed to toxic conditions without hazard pay. We've seen um, Governor Cuomo, this sort of liberal hero, uh, we've seen him close, uh, cut Medicaid and close public hospitals even during a pandemic. So, you know, COVID has made, I think, just all of this stuff more urgent. Um, and then finally, I think for Black Lives Matter and the movement for justice after the murder of George Floyd, I think that ultimately our vision, you know, um, we as the left have thought a lot about uh, in recent times how to humanize sort of the criminal justice system by getting rid of cops as the first responders to social problems, figuring out other ways to respond to social problems that arise. But ultimately, you know, we as socialists want to make sure that the fundamental causes of those social problems are being dealt with in a way that the social problems don't even appear. So yes, it's, it, it is true that if there's someone who's having a mental health crisis, they shouldn't be met by, you know, a cop with a gun. But it's also true that our mental health crises are caused by a system that is, you know, that is uh, fundamentally undermining people's security. The overdose uh, opioid problems, the violence in poor neighborhoods. And for these things to be fixed, it's not a matter just of changing how we allocate the existing budget. It's a matter also of massively increasing our social supports for working class people. If you have you know, good schools, you have less crime. If you have a more even distribution of income, you have less crime. If you have like, um, if you have housing, you know, it, a great example of this actually is homelessness, right? Yes, police should not be sent in to respond to homeless people or try to move them around. They should be treated with dignity and should be um, not persecuted by the state. Also though, we're socialists. We don't believe there should be any homeless people, period. And so I think the Tax the Rich campaign is the sort of the way of addressing kind of the fundamental roots, the fundamental causes of this brutal system of mass incarceration that the US, uh, the US has set up. Um, so many of the racial inequalities in our society have been exacerbated, expanded over these last 50 years because of the concentration of income and ownership in the hands of a tiny few. And we have the chance to create a, a big coalition, a vast majority, that stands against that and that creates an infrastructure for true equality in our society. And, and so be, beyond the, I guess the material gains that uh, would be achieved um, through this tax reform, what, what bigger consequences do you see in terms of class power, in terms of social transformation and democracy? Um, I mean, I, I often, um, talk about the New York Health Act and how, you know, providing, um, you know, health care to everyone doesn't just make them healthier, it also gives them much more economic freedom in terms of the labor market. It also, uh, you know, it, it just it just democratizes um, uh, society in so many ways because now workers have one less thing to worry about in terms of bargaining with, you know, uh, business owners and they're able to really focus on deepening their material well-being as a result of having uh, healthcare covered. So, so what larger consequences do you foresee if, if this, these reforms were to be successful? Yeah, I mean, you've already, you've already said a lot of it because things like the New York Health Act are only possible if we get more revenue in the state's coffers. I think, um, you know, free CUNY, um, returning the CUNY. Once upon a time, New York State was a leader in education because it had a free public university system that um, was taken away uh, after the fiscal crisis in the 70s. We want to get it back. 
this would allow us to do that and would again free working class parents from worrying about the cost of sending their child children to college universal pre-k you know new york city finally instituted new york's uh, universal pre-k but it should be statewide um we want our schools fully funded we want so um you know if people have access to better transportation that means they're less reliant on the automobile industry they can also compete in more labor markets which allows them to bargain up their wages um i think those a whole number of things like the kinds of infrastructure change we would make would empower working class people um i also think you know one of the ways in which this campaign i think was formulated was the idea that so many decisions are made by the budget in albany but that that budget is a pass through a very secretive process it's basically like andrea cuomo and mm -hmm. and the um the house leader uh, carl hasty and the senate majority leader uh, andrea stewart cousins all meet in a room and basically make massive decisions about the nature of new york state um even our imperfect legislative process is like further winnowed down. So legislators have very little word about that. So I think part of the goal of this campaign is to over time democratize decisions as to how much revenue is being taken up and what it's getting spent on. Um, so New Yorkers see the budget as a moral document, as something that is making fundamental um, decisions about the lives New Yorkers lead. And so I think that you know, the hope with this campaign. And I think, you know, it's not a, there are things we hope to win in one year, but this is like a long-term campaign to democratize our society and to rebuild what, you know, historian Joshua Freeman, what's called working class New York, New York as a leader of uh, a working class social democratic vision of what a society could be. Um, so I think that, yeah. And in terms of like how power would shift, how our lives would shift, I think being able to win a campaign like this where we actually take wealth away you know it's very hard to take wealth away from the wealthiest um civil rights movement found this that you know destroying jim crow which you would think would be like just the hardest thing in the world um because you know here's this like semi-fascist state right that was actually easier than getting the wealthy to like cough up enough money to end unemployment in this country right so <laughs> getting the wealthy to cough up money is really hard we, if we do the organizing, build our capacities to be able to do that on a large scale, like then we are serious players in politics. The working class is serious players in politics. Yeah. So let's talk um, strategy, timeline and coordination around the campaign. I mean, how do we get there? We know that there is a social democratic caucus in the state assembly pushing for this. Um, do they have a legislative strategy? And how are they working with grassroots uh, organizations and activists? Where do you see hope uh, and where do you see hurdles? Great question. Um, I think, I mean, the short answer is yes. <laughs> the long answer is, uh, I think the, you know, kind of the big flashpoint that's coming is the budget, um, which is going to be basically kind of put out there in March and then passed like first day of April or so. So these next few months are going to be key for the campaign. Um, I think that, you know, uh, I'm a DSA member in New York City DSA. And one of our big ideas fundamentally is what sometimes called an inside outside strategy that um, we need people in the halls of power doing this work. You know, our the socialist legislators, they're on these tax the rich bills. Um, their names are on these bills. They're organizing co-sponsors. They're bringing up in conference what they're going to be about. But, you know, that in and of itself is not going to get you very far unless there's people power putting, um, you know, flames to the feet of especially the non-socialist legislators who are still obviously the vast majority in, <laughs> in these houses, um, let alone Governor Cuomo, like the anti-socialist legislator. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I think that, you know, one of the exciting things about this is building real infrastructure for statewide organizing. I think we've seen in the New York State housing movement how successful that's been. Um, housing Justice for All, uh, in which DSA plays an important role, built a coalition that extends, you know, that doesn't allow the elites to, to um, uh, pose New York City against the rest of New York State. It doesn't do like upstate, downstate, urban, rural. It tries to really build a very wide coalition. 
And I think the hope is that this, this is gonna help build us there. Um, this, this campaign has a similar basis for organizing like a big majority of New Yorkers. And I think, you know, I already mentioned the 90% figure um, of people who agree with this demand uh, in terms of our, you know, our field and our campaign organizing. Um, chapters of DSA around the state have started taking up doing phone banks. So Syracuse, um, Lower Hudson Valley, Nassau, uh, uh, Buffalo, uh, 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 Suffolk County, like so a whole number, uh, Upper Hudson Valley, a whole number of chapters are plugging in. And I think the more we get uh, activists who are active all over the state, the more likely this is to succeed. Now, you know, again, we want to raise $50 billion and at least and set New York on a fundamentally new path. So one of the things about these bills is they're not, you know, temporary bills. They're not like, you know, little around the edges, like, you know, even Cuomo, you might be able to get him on something like uh, Peter Tear tax or even like say legalizing marijuana, which would raise some revenue, but you know, nothing like in or the level we need to fund our transportation system or the New York health act or um, green infrastructure, green new deal. So I think that, you know, we want bills that are going to create permanent sources of revenue that are not minor, that are major. They're going to create real revenue for the state um, and that are going to set up New York state on a fundamentally new fiscal basis. That is a big win. It's going to take time. Um, but I think we, we've already gone in fairly far. Like the, originally the speaker of the house, um, the assembly and the uh, Senate majority leader were really not, talking about this. Now they are in the media trying to pose as like, we love tax the rich. Yes, tax the rich. Um, I think that's a good sign. Uh, do I think it's entirely honest? Like, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so, you know, we are still holding their feet to the fire, building a legislative caucus in each of the legislative houses, as well as outside pressure targeting certain legislators. That's we hope is going to act on those two players who then we hope will act on Cuomo. We get as far as we can get, and I think we can get pretty far. I think it's very possible we can get at least one out of six of these bills passed, maybe more, um, this session. And then we set ourselves up for future organizing and work, whether it's primarying legislators who dare in a pandemic stand against uh, funding our state, you know, who stand for cuts rather than um, for uh, supporting working class people, all the people who've made such sacrifices during the pandemic. Um, we set ourselves up for going after Governor Cuomo in the long term, who's, you know, a big fish, but is clearly one of the now kind of the uh, blockage of a much more progressive New York state um, than we've had in, you know, 40 years. Uh, I think those and then broadening the capacity of our chapters all over the state to coordinate um, activists, to coordinate all over the state and also to share skills like running uh, legislative campaigns, running elections, other things that continue to build up infrastructure and power um, over the long term. Again, I think this campaign, you know, just an anecdote, I was like passing out door hangers. Um, and uh, this one lady, I was like giving her my spiel. She thought I was just putting on a door hanger, but she thought I was like trying to break into her house. <laughs> so she comes out and, and then I'm like, no, 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 I promise. Mm -hmm. I just like tell you about tax the rich, right? And so, you know, we talked for a little while and she's like, She's very excited. She's like, yeah, you know, the rich, they don't pay enough. It's crazy. We need this to happen. What are our legislators doing? And then the guy at the apartment next to her, like opens up his door and he's like, Hey, can I have one of those? Like, you're totally right. Like the rich just, uh, how do they get away with this? And, you know, I think everyone sees what's what Jeff Bezos or Michael Bloomberg are running away with during this time of suffering for working class people. So it's, it's a great issue to organize around. It's very unifying. And it, it strikes at the fundamentals of what's creating the inequalities in our society, racial, economic, um, the, the, the deep inequalities baked into our society. And on that note, Jeremy, how, how, where do people go to learn more about this campaign or to get involved? Yeah, so um, look at the website investinrny.org, investinrny.org. Um, it's really great and has uh, kind of a, play by play of the various bills. And then please sign up for phone banks. That's like the biggest new push that we're doing right now is to build consciousness, to build organizing capacity all over this state. 
Um, and you can join people from all over the state in organizing for taxing the rich. And the way place to sign up there is bit.ly slash tax the rich NYS, tax the rich New York State. Bit.ly slash tax the rich NYS. Well, thank you, Jeremy. This has been the Inquiring Socialist. I am Maribel Teneo with Jeremy Cohen, sociologist and North Brooklyn representative on the New York City DSA Steering Committee. But I did want to make a quick comment. I wish we had more time because the whole time I was thinking with, with Jeremy's presentation, how you know Martin Luther King just had a birthday. And what, one of the things that not everybody understands about Martin Luther King is that he saw racial justice as uh, tied with social democracy. Totally. And, oh, yeah. and in, in his book, Where Do We Go From Here, Community or Chaos, he, he realizes that desegregation doesn't work because schools were not equalized, that what needed to happen was this type of massive investment that Jeremy talked about. And, and to me, you know, I think tax the rich is a way of reviving that tradition of, uh, you know, uh, of like the, the fight for social democracy as hand in hand with. This has been Ithaca DSA Presents. Thank you for watching. One, two, one, two, three.